From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Uh, Hugh Bryan, Mr. Dollar. How are you this morning? Not so good. I didn't sleep very well. How'd you do? I think I have about what you want on John Reardon. Well, if you haven't, I can get it from Mrs. Reardon. What? Well, I thought you didn't want to tell her about the report, that her husband might still be alive. She knows. She overheard us talking last night. Oh. Well, what do you want to do? I might as well look at what you have and get this over with. How about an hour from now? I'll be waiting for you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account item six, dollar and a half. One collect telegram from Denver, Colorado. I've located Frank Bowers as per your request. Cursory investigation discloses little evidence that would lead me to believe he might be the John Ridden of Baltimore. Looks like a ham bone to me, Johnny. What do I do now? Sign George Hanley, George Hanley Investigations Incorporated, Denver, Colorado. Item seven, two dollars, same thing. Telegram from me. Things are about the same way here. Sit tight, I'll see you in a day or two. Love, Johnny. Once the telegrams were out of the way, I walked three blocks from my hotel to the office building of Hugh Bryan. It was an impressive place full of lawyers and doctors. Hugh Bryan looked a little haggard when I saw him. It took me a while to get all this together. Half the night. There wasn't that big a rush. Oh, get it out of the way. The sooner you have what you need, the sooner you can make sure, and the sooner I won't worry about it anymore. Uh, did you talk to Elizabeth yet today? No, just last night. Oh, I thought maybe she might have called you this morning. I'm... Uh, I'm so sorry for that girl. Well, don't feel too bad, Mr. Bryan. We both did everything we could to keep the report that her husband might be alive from her. Awkward as it was. Yes, I know, I know. I still don't understand it, I guess. Well, a man named Coombs, an insurance official, thinks he saw Reardon in Denver last week using the name Frank Bowers. He's sure that Bowers was Reardon. If he turns out to be Reardon, the insurance company's been taken for $20,000 they paid to Elizabeth Reardon, just to set you straight. Well, that'd make Elizabeth party to a fraud. And John. Lord knows that's silly. Well, silly or not. Yes. Well, here's what I have. Now, this is one of the last pictures taken of John Reardon. Mm-hmm. Have the negatives? Yes. Uh, here. And these are some vital statistics on him. The physical part I got from his doctor. Mm -hmm. He stood an examination about a month before the accident. This is the doctor's name here? Yes. Now, these other things are in his background and education. Uh, here, a copy of his marriage license, birth certificate. How did you get hold of these things? Well, I handled a lot of business for John, filed a lot of his papers for him. These were just packed away. It took a while to find them. Hey. Hmm? A copy of his fingerprints? Well, would those help? More than any of this other stuff. Fingerprints aren't standard papers in anybody's file. Before John went in the Army, he did some engineering work for the Proving Grounds in Aberdeen. Oh. He was fingerprinted there. It was a gag at the time. He had a set of his own blown up and put on the wall in a picture frame. You know, just a joke. Yeah. I dug them out of his personal things. Now then, here's a copy of his financial records, tax returns and whatnot. I spent about an hour in Hugh Bryan's office going over material that would help me in the investigation. The pictures and fingerprints were the most helpful items. After I'd finished, I went back to my hotel, packed my bags and checked out. <laughs> Expense account item eight, $398. My hotel and incidentals in Baltimore and plane fare to Denver. I got there at nine in the morning. The air crisp, thin, and full of sunshine. I rented a car at the airport and drove into town. A half an hour later, I was talking to my detective friend, George Hanley. How do you like Denver, old pal? I haven't been here for a few years. It doesn't look the same. Bigger and better, huh? They're thinking of putting up buildings as big as those mountains over there. I love it. So does the wife. I'm glad. You ought to try a place like this for a while, Johnny. Uh, maybe I will. Ought to find yourself a girl and settle down. Uh, let's us settle down, Georgie. Huh? Oh, sure. How'd it go? 
You asked me to look into Frank Bowers. I looked into him as much as I could without talking to him. There you are, Johnny. His bank account, his friends, his troubles, his enemies, everything. Mm -hmm. How about his police record? One traffic violation two years ago. Never been in any kind of trouble around here. Gets along fine with everybody. Well, tell me about everybody, Georgie. His laundryman, the milkman, the guy who tends bar in his neighborhood, the man he buys gas from. I talk to all of them. How about the people he works with? Well, he don't do much of that as far as I can see. He's got an office downtown, calls himself a consulting engineer. Goes there once or twice a week to pick up his mail. Well, now, that's a very nice way to be able to live. Is he starving to death, Georgie? No, he's got a good bank account. Makes regular deposits. Money comes from a New York bonding firm. He owns a little two-bedroom house out beyond Park Hill. Paid $38,000 for it. Wow. Sleeps in one bedroom, uses the other one for a kind of studio. Putters around with clay, oils, and according to the nosy dame who lives across the street, he tries to write. How about his friends? Lots of them. Pays his bills, gets drunk now and then, normal. Tell me about his wife. He hasn't got one. Lives alone. Find out who he goes with, Georgie? No. As much as I could find out, he doesn't go with anybody. Enemies? Well, the guy in the cleaning shop hates his guts. Bowers doesn't like his shirts with starch. <laughs> Did you check out the residency business? As far as I could. He bought that house out in Park Hill in 1951. Paid cash for it. Record of the sale gives his former residence is Toledo, Ohio. Well, how long has he been a resident here? As near as I can figure, and this is just rough, four or five years ago, the first financial transaction was the house he bought. The next was a car. He could have been here a long time before that, though. Well, the time element would fit for Reardon. What do you think, Georgie? I think you're probably wasting a lot of money investigating this guy. He doesn't seem like the kind of man who's hiding out from anybody. Here, <clears throat> look at this photo. Is this Frank Bowers? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. 5'11", 170, olive complexion, no scars, no glasses, brown hair, about 35. Could be him from that, yes. This is a picture of John Reardon, and the description is Reardon's. What do you want to do now? Keep on it. I got George Hanley busy making a check with some people in Toledo who could find out whether or not a Frank Bauer had once lived there. Then I took my rented car and drove out to the address Hanley had given me. It was in the east side of the city near the airport, a one-story frame house, a 53 Merc in the driveway. I'm looking for Mr. Frank Bowers. Oh, who are you? Johnny Dollar. Oh, I'm Frank Bauer. Well, I'm an insurance investigator, Mr. Bowers. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, well, come on in. Huh? Thank you. Take chair anywhere, huh? Son, you might. Just making a routine check, Mr. Bowers. Thought perhaps you could help me. <laughs> well, I don't know anything about my neighbors, if that's that kind of thing. No, I'm running down a report that came across our office in Baltimore. Baltimore? Ever been there, Mr. Bowers? No. Swell place on Chesapeake Bay. Well, I like Denver. <laughs> What's this all about? Huh? Well, do you happen to remember a few days ago when you were at a place called the Ship's Tavern? Well, that's in the Brown Palace. This was uh, last Friday, to be exact. Well, should I remember? What I do, steal an ashtray or walk out on a check? No, a, a man from Baltimore was there that day, Mr. Bowers. His name was Coombs. Paul Coombs. You met him. Well, well, did I? Yes, right at the bar. You had a drink or two with him. Well, I might have. I don't know whether to admit it or not. What are you getting at? I, I don't understand this. I know it seems confusing. Uh, uh, maybe this will help. Take a look at this. Mm-hmm. Now, you must admit, you look a great deal like the man in that picture. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose I do. Well, I'll be done. Hey, I'd do it that. You know, this could be a picture of me. That's why I'm here, Mr. Powers. You see, the company I represent insured the man in this picture for quite an amount of money. His name was John Reardon. He was lost in a boat accident in Chesapeake Bay five years ago. The Mr. Coombs who met you at the bar here last week thought you were John Reardon. Well, I don't blame him. But I'm not. Close, though. Now, want to smoke? Oh, thanks. Thanks. Sure. Mr. Coombs was a lifelong friend of John Reardon's. I have his sworn statement here about that meeting with you and the certainty of his identity. You do? Yes, right here. Would you like to see it? <laughs> well, not particularly. I understand you went to Ohio State. What year did you graduate? I didn't go to Ohio State. Look, what is this? Huh? Well, that's what you told Mr. Coombs. It's in the statement. Oh, I remember that bird now. Oh, I might have told him anything, Mr. Dollar. You know, he's one of those inquisitive kind, real sure of himself. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Look, don't tell me they sent you all the way out here from Baltimore. They did. 
On that guy say so? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> That's funny. Did you go to college, Mr. Powers? What? I'd like to clear up that detail. Did you go to college? Well, yes, yes. I went to Carnegie Tech, 36 through 40. You haven't lived all your life in Colorado, then. Where else have you lived? Look, do you have any right to ask me questions like this? No, no, but you'll help me a lot if you'll answer them. Well, why not? Okay, I've lived in New York, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Toledo, around the country. Came here a few years ago with my health. Seemed good for my asthma. Ever been married? Once in 1942. It didn't last long. Oh, what else you want to know? Well, look, you in a hurry? I can come back later. No, no, you... it's not that. It's Well, look, you seem like a nice guy, Dollar, but it just makes me uncomfortable answering these questions of yours. I appreciate the time you've given me already, Mr. Bauer. Please understand, it's a matter of establishing identity. But you know who I am. I just told you. That's true. I don't like this business much. Is there, is there any way you can eliminate it? The most positive identification would be from fingerprints. Oh? Now, Mr. Bauer, I'm not so much interested in who you are as in proving that you're not John Reardon. If you volunteered a set of fingerprints, it'd save me a great deal of work and you a great deal of trouble. Well, sure, why not? <laughs> We drove downtown together to George Hanley's office and used the portable fingerprint kit. I took a complete set of Frank Bauer's prints he attached. I thanked him for his time and trouble, and he left. If he was trying to cover something, it certainly wasn't apparent from his conversational reactions. There had been a moment when I was sure he wasn't Frank Bauer. On the other hand, I was sure that he wasn't John Ridden. That cuts it, Johnny. Right thumb and index prints don't match at all. Oh, not even close, George. And I thought I was getting somewhere. I found out he was never in Toledo, or at least never registered or licensed as an engineer. Well, these prints do it. When are you going home, Johnny? Oh, uh, I don't know. There's no reason to stick around any longer. This is crazy. You proved your case with the prints. He was too anxious to help me prove it, Georgie. You ask any ordinary man on the street two personal questions about himself, and he'll tell you to go jump in the lake. You ask him for his fingerprints, and he's liable to smash you. So? Get on him. Stay with him 24 hours a day. Get a couple of other men. It'll cost you money. Get busy. Expense account item nine, $200, detective service. I didn't believe Frank Bowers. I didn't believe his background. And most of all, I didn't believe his fingerprints. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, another man comes to Denver. He doesn't check in a hotel or carry luggage. At least not much luggage. Just a 38 Colt. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>